Welcome to the Lemieux Center for Public Policy at Palm Beach Atlantic University. We've welcomed lots of great guests here to Palm Beach Atlantic for our many events with great speakers from around the world. Today we're doing it virtually due to the pandemic and today you're going to have the treat of meeting with a great American leader, uh, former colonel in the military, uh, ambassador, global AIDS coordinator, and most importantly, the coronavirus response coordinator. But before we start, let me turn things over to the president of Palm Beach Atlantic University, Dr. Deborah Schwinn. Thank you. Dr. Burks, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for um, all of your work in immunology and HIV AIDS. As a fellow physician scientist, I really appreciate everything that you've done to help protect us across the globe and also for today in your coronavirus efforts. Um, I'd like to just take a moment and tell you a little bit about Palm Beach Atlantic University. We are a Christian liberal arts university that's based predominantly in West Palm Beach and also with a branch campus in Orlando and some online students. We have about 3,700 total students. We combine faith and academics and the strength of those academics has been seen recently in the number of Fulbright scholars that we have. We're incredibly proud to send three Fulbright scholars across the globe in January of this year. We also have two that have been selected to stay in their countries this year and be training and teaching Fulbright scholars and even one alumni from another university. Um, at this point then, I'd like to, to say that PBA has been very active in terms of coronavirus. We opened our campus in early <coughs> August and we've finished 10 weeks with fairly low coronavirus levels and we've been having in-campus and in-classroom training the whole time. So I'm really looking forward to what you have to say to us today about coronavirus. Thank you. Thank Go you, ahead. Dr. Schwinn. Dr. Burks, welcome. Glad to have you here today. It's a real honor to have you at our first uh, sort of video interview of a great leader like yourself. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be with you. And I would like to have the first slide so that I can just take everyone quickly through how the epidemic looks and has looked over the last three months. But the first panel across the bottom is three months ago, followed by two months ago, one month ago, and where it, it, this country stands today. This is a report from the governor's report that we send out weekly for the last four months to every governor in the United States. In that report, we talk about specifically what's happening in that state, analyze its epidemic, talk about the recommendations related to their epidemic, go county by county in the state and metro by metro to really show where the epidemic is in that state and where things are stable in that state. You can see from this series of panels that the outbreak that we had across the South three months ago is beginning, four months ago, is beginning to improve. And now we see the virus, and this is cases per 100,000. We see the virus has moved up into the heartland and into the upper Northwest. This is particularly concerning to us as temperatures cool about the level of community spread that exists in these states and in specific counties at this time. The next slide, this was cases, the next slide actually looks at test positivity. And again, the panels across the bottom show three months ago, two months ago, one month ago, and where we are currently. I just wanna make sure that that's the right slide. Can you go to the next slide just so I can make sure that you have the right slide up? Yes, thank you, go back one. So this test positivity is one of our early warning signs for where the virus is improving and where it's deteriorating as far as community spread. When your test positivity begins to increase, it means that you're finding a higher proportion of cases in the general population. It also means that those cases are increasing across the general population rather than decreasing. So we're always triangulating case data and test data to really understand what's happening across the country. Next slide. Of course, cases and increasing test positivity often lead to increased fatalities because in community spread and with the level of comorbidities of the American people, we are protecting the nursing homes, assisted living and senior centers well, but there are a lot of individuals, vulnerable individuals that exist in our communities. 
that when you have large community spread, the virus comes to them, even when they're being fairly cautious because of events that occur in their households. And so you can see that we still have significant fatalities coming from the original outbreak in the summer. So no one should be reassured when we see case rising and hospitalizations rising that the fatalities will not rise subsequently. And so that's why we're continuing to ask every American to take the precaution of wearing a mask, physically distancing, doing your hygiene, and really ensuring that you're protecting those aunts and uncles, grandparents and parents that have those comorbidities, because many of you under 35 can be infected what we call asymptomatically or silently. In other words, you feel fine, you don't think you're infected, but you actually are. And so this spectrum of disease is very difficult for everyone to comprehend because we have a virus can, that can do everything from very few symptoms to no symptoms, all the way through moderate to significant disease, all the way to fatalities in people that are particularly vulnerable. And I know this is difficult for every American to understand that they could be infected silently, but they can. And that is what starts that original spread of the virus. It's what we're seeing in Europe. You can see high test positivity in young people. That then spreads to individuals who are older and in families and eventually reach those, those individuals with significant comorbidities resulting in hospitalizations and unfortunately at times fatalities. I know there were gonna be questions and answers, so I'll stop there to see what the discussion is. Dr. Burks, thank you for that presentation. Uh, you mentioned masks, you mentioned social distancing. Uh, th these are things that Americans are doing. We're certainly doing them here in Florida. There's been a lot of debate uh, around other issues like shutdowns, whether you know we should be involved in more shutdowns. There's concerns now about a second wave uh, what's your position on, you know, quarantining in place and shutting down versus the other measures of masks and social distancing? Well, I've been able, I've been privileged to travel the country and I've been to over 35 states and over 25 universities in the last few months. And that's really the way you tackle epidemics. And that's why it's been a privilege to be part of the coronavirus task force because I bring on the ground experience of tackling epidemics previously, tackling HIV, tackling TB. And we've shown great progress in Sub-Saharan Africa and in other low-income countries and middle-income countries. But you can't just tackle a virus by dealing only with the science. You have to translate the science down to the community level and work with the communities in each age group where they are. And so right today, up in the Northeast, if we could get out sentinel surveillance testing in that first population, the first population that we know is, is our sentinel surveillance population, young people who are out and about in the community, if we can get them tested um, and find those asymptomatic cases, what I do know in dealing with every young person across the country, they will isolate if they know that they are infected and they will protect the vulnerables in their household. And what's given me great hope in this moment of what we can do as a community is watching across the universities. I've been to universities with great campaigns just in Penn State a few days ago with a mask up or pack up campaign, making it clear if students don't follow these clear behaviors that we know help to control the virus and decrease spread, that there will be community spread on those, on those college campuses. They also have a great slogan of our community, our responsibility. And I think what I've seen among young people, yes, there was a group that was infected early on when students came back to campus. That is true in any population in any epidemic. It's a bell-shaped curve of behaviors. So we always have a high risk group. But we have a group in the middle that is following direction, that are masking up, that are protecting their community, knowing it's their responsibility. And that gives me hope as Americans that that group in the middle that's holding in university after university across the South and universities that open across the upper Midwest and Northeast. As Americans, if we can learn from our students, of what they've done to be able to stay on the college campuses, 
they are highly motivated to be there and have in-person learning. We should be highly motivated to protect one another by doing these, uh, these masking, physical distancing, our communities, our responsibility. And then when you stop that initial wave and prevent that infection of the older populations or the more vulnerable individuals, then you don't have to talk about additional mitigation procedures. If you look at what the South was able to do across the Sun Belt, they were able to mitigate their significant community spread, even though what they got behind at the beginning by not really containing that early silent spread through utilizations of masks while keeping all retail open by just some decrease in indoor dining, but closing bars that had stand up bars that people really congregated close together. They were able to dramatically change the trajectory of their epidemic. So we have the scientific evidence, not only theoretic evidence or on paper evidence, we have implementation evidence of what can happen when we implement at scale. And as a group of Americans, we agree to work together to not only mask up and physically distance, but really ensure that we're not on masking in gatherings in households that really increase the increased substantially the opportunity for community spread. That was what drove the epidemic across the Sun Belt. And that's the kind of behavioral change that we need right now across most of America as we move into the colder weather. Well, that's really heartening to hear, Dr. Burks, and thank you for that. that and we've learned that in Florida, that we can open our businesses as long as we're responsible and, and drive those numbers down. So thank you for that. You mentioned testing. One of the frustrations that a lot of people have had is the ability to get results quickly. You know, we hear about other countries where people can walk down the street and get a result in 15 minutes, and we're starting to get more rapid tests. Uh, hard to tell somebody that they have to stay at home because uh, they might have been exposed if they don't get a test result back for five days or seven days. Can you talk to us about the progress of getting rapid tests and the availability across the country? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. I think there's two components of that. One. We can increase today our nucleic acid testing platform and our turnaround time if people would move to pooling in the large commercial labs and if our universities and our research universities would turn on their medical research equipment in the same way many of our veterinary groups have turned on the veterinary RNA platform. And so we still have residual capacity in the United States. I call everyone's attention to what the Broad Institute did. When we had a call to action back in March and April, asking our research institutions to contribute to the solution, the Broad Institute not only turned on all their equipment, but really revolutionized COVID-19 testing. And they're doing tens of thousands. They crossed over a million tests done at an institution, a single research institution. And they did that because they brought together a talent base and answered the problem we were having with testing with a solution. A solution now that's providing testing to over 100 universities and colleges in the upper north Northeast. This is really what every single research university in the United States could have done, and we're still asking them to do. And that would really increase not only the capacity to test students weekly or twice a week, but also increase the capacity to test in the community. At the same time, we've worked tirelessly with research um, institutions through RADx to develop new tests, but also critically working with our large diagnostic companies to bring online the kinds of tests that we've used in HIV for a number of decades, and those are the rapid tests. And they are now available now in multiple platforms. And what we're hoping is we figure out algorithms where two of those tests together can do the same thing that increases the positive predictive value or the true positives and the true negatives. And there will be enough tests to really dramatically increase those rapid turnaround tests. They can be used singly, um, but in low, low prevalence in areas, in areas where you want to really get ahead of the epidemic, where you want to test people at the forefront and what we talk about these sentinel surveillance communities, combining two of these tests like a Quadel, Safia, and an antigen test from Binox now will allow you to have increased positive predictive value and negative predictive value. And this really then becomes our ability to rapidly test young people and have young people come forward as they have on the college campuses 
the green to routine regular testing so we can find that early silent community spread across this country and prevent the large outbreaks that we saw across the Sun Belt. This can be prevented. We have the testing tools to do that now, but tests have to be used correctly and in the right population. Thank you. Final question for you, Dr. Burks. Uh, the whole country is interested, and certainly people here in Florida are interested about the vaccine. Uh, we know that there are several clinical trials right now. Uh, what is your uh, view about the vaccine? When do you think that the vaccine will be administered? Will it be that there will be several different vaccines available? Uh, when do you think uh, the general population might get the vaccine? Because we understand that first responders, medical professionals, and others may get it first. So talk to us about the vaccine, if you will, and its development. Well, thank you. And I just want to thank our NIH and other research scientists and our large pharmaceutical companies that really heeded the call and began working on vaccines as soon as the sequence was available. And, as, and with this virus, as opposed to some of the other RNA viruses that I've had the privilege to work on, this virus is we have evidence of how individuals with natural infection clear the virus. We know that there's neutralizing antibody. And so these vaccines, all of the different vaccine platforms that are under investigation are targeting this same, what we call the spike protein of the virus that's critical of how that virus gets into your body. Know that these viruses, they can't do anything outside of your body. So their whole job in life is to get into you and into one of your cells so that they can use your cell machinery to replicate itself because it can't outside of our cells. And so this particular, all of the, all of the vaccines are generating antibody, what we call neutralizing antibody against this spike protein that binds to one of your cellular receptors that allows this virus in. So the whole point of these vaccines is to prevent replication of this virus and either provide what we call sterilized immunity, no replication, or very low level replication that leads to rapid control of the infection in the individuals. And that question is still out there of how these vaccines will specifically work. So we have two trials um, that are in their latest last stage of evaluation of what we call phase three. Um, many of those individuals on the trials, I, I am assuming at this time by just watching some of the numbers that potentially up to two thirds of individuals may have gotten their second dose, but we know that now we're looking for events. What do I mean by that? We're counting infections because obviously this is a double blind placebo controlled trial. We don't know who got the vaccine, um, but we are counting who is getting infected. And so that all that data will go to what we call the independent data safety monitoring board that have nothing to do with any of us. And they will independently make recommendations on whether the vaccine is safe and efficacious. So those first two vaccines are in their late last stage of development and the furthest along with enrollment and have the ability now to start looking at whether they're efficacious or safe. And those are the two messenger RNA vaccines. And we have two, what we call vectored um, vaccines. They are using vectors to actually express the protein so that you make the immune response. Those two have begun phase three trials, but are currently on hold right now in the United States, and that's the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca products. And then finally, we have protein antigen subunit, again, spike protein, and adjuvant, a classic way we've made vaccines for decades. It's the way we made the hepatitis B vaccine. They are just beginning their development or just beginning what we call that last stage um, phase three trial. And so what's encouraging to me, having worked on vaccines for quite a long time, um, is that we have multiple platforms to be able to generate novel immune responses that we believe are associated with protection and the data is out and we'll be able to see that from these trials but multiple different ways to generate that immune response. And that's really important. So a long answer of saying, we believe that there will be early data sometime the end of this month, beginning of next month on base, what the comp companies are predicting. I can't tell you that for sure, because it totally depends on what the rate of infection is in those communities where the individuals, and thank you, thank, I'm so grateful to those individuals who stood up and rolled in these trials because it depends on them getting exposed to the virus naturally 
and those events occurring. And that's difficult to predict. As I showed you the last four months, the virus has moved around the country in different ways. And so um, we're waiting on that data. We should have data, we hope, within the next few weeks. And then that will lead to immunization, as you described, in the groups that each of the states decide who should receive immunizations first. And there's two approaches to this. First responders that may more likely be exposed to the virus or those individuals most likely to have a more difficult outcome when infected with the virus are more vulnerable Americans. We know that those two groups together are about 100 million individuals. And we know from the manufacturing that those do doses will be available when the virus is show, when the trials show efficacy. And so that first group should be able to be immunized in the November, December, January timeframe, depending on when we see efficacy. And I want to applaud the states and the CDC working together to develop these vaccination plans and really thank the American people again for the number of people who volunteered. Remember, all ages volunteered, all races, all ethnicities, and all genders to really give us that insight on how that vaccine will work for um, the American people. And I just, we are only as good as our individuals who stand up and volunteer. And so in support of all of those individuals who have volunteered for us to get these vaccines, to be able to show whether they're efficacious or not, we owe it to them to be able to do what we can in our individual behaviors to prevent the spread of the virus now, to be that bridge to when we will have an effective vaccine that will protect the American people. We can be that bridge. We know what to do. It's just ensuring that we do it in public and private every day. And we're not talking about that much more time. So we've been through this a long time together and I know it's become wearing but we have the capacity to change our future and to really be that bridge to prevent these outbreaks in the community spread until we can get a vaccine that will create the herd immunity that is needed to prevent future outbreaks of this virus. Well, Dr. Burks, Ambassador Burks, we're so thankful to you. We're thankful for your leadership. You've been a great inspirational voice to the American people and a calm and steady leader during a very difficult time. So thank you for all that you've done for the country and will continue to do. And thank you for being with us here, uh, at least virtually. We hope we can maybe bring you down here in person to Palm Beach Atlantic yes. University in beautiful South Florida. And we're just very grateful for all that you do for our country. Thank you, it's great seeing both of you today. And remember, they all, they're physically distanced, but they were all wearing their masks too before we started. So. We can all be masked together to really help us stop the spread of this virus. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Ambassador. Well, thank you again for joining us for this uh, conversation of consequence here at the Palm Beach Atlantic University with Ambassador Burke and Dr. Schwinn. We learned a lot of good information about how we can operate and how we can operate safely. Absolutely, and her emphasis on masks was great. Our students have been really wonderful about wearing their masks here at Palm Beach Atlantic. Yeah, and I think that's the great heartening message of what the ambassador told us is that we can operate, we can go back to school, we can go back to work, we can go about our lives, but we have to wear our masks, we have to stay socially distant. And the good news is, is that in a month or two or three, we're going to have a vaccine most likely, and that's going to really make it a lot healthier and safer for us. But we're almost there. As she said, there's a bridge, and we have to do the things we need to do to get across that bridge. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you on campus uh, in next year for some in-person Lemieux Center events. We've got some great speakers that we're working on for you. And thank you for all you do. God bless you. And we look forward to welcoming you in person back to Palm Beach Atlantic University.